right, everybody. Welcome to the Great Fossil Site. And thanks for stopping by today. And we have a treat for you. This is Professor Mick Whitelaw. He's one of our geology professors at ETSU. Today he is going to be talking to you about trilobites. So if you haven't gone to our temporary exhibit hall, you guys should check it out. It's pretty cool. So I'll give it over to Mick. Thank you. Um, what's going around, uh, we'll talk about it in a little while, but uh, that's a piece of calcite crystal. And actually, calcite is, is the mineral that makes up all the lime rocks around here. But it just happens that trilobites make the lenses for their eyes out of calcite. Like we've got a squash, squishy eye that we change um, by using mussels. They actually have a, a crystal that does the same job. So that's a piece of it. The other fun part with calcite is it splits the light two ways. So if you put it over anything, you'll see two, two of everything. So, saves on beer on a Saturday night. <laughs> go straight to the cup slide. So, but we're going to talk about trilobites today. Um, and this is a, a really fantastic group of, of organisms. Um, probably after dinosaurs, one of the most recognised and favourite you know, critters out there that makes fossils. Um, there's a pretty good reason for that. Um, there are over 17,000 species of trilobite recognise that point. If you go into the literature, the number bounces between 15 and 20,000 species of these things, right? which is a lot of, of species. So um, the trilobites evolved in the Cambrian period, and we'll have some time scales later on to try to kind of put this into perspective, um, but that's basically about 540 million years ago. Um, and I'm going to say the trilobites first show up in the fossil record more correctly at that point. Um, and when they do, they're everywhere. Um, and that's a bit of a problem because, you know, they have to evolve from something, and that's got to take a little time. And so most people now think that the trilobites had a longer history. Um, and I'm bad because I don't normally do invertebrate fossils. I call them the squishies and crunchies, right? So they were in the squishy stage. Right, it, before 550 million years ago, and because they were soft tissue animals, they didn't fossilize. And then they came up with this right, molting carapace, this exoskeleton, and then all of a sudden the fossils are everywhere. Um, and as soon as we see them, they're very diverse, there's different types, and they're everywhere. So we think there must have been a much, much longer history beforehand. So they went from a squishy stage to a crunchy stage, if you will. That's the science for the day, we'll do it that way. Right. Um, and they evolved in the Cambrian period. There was an explosion of life at this point. And again, it may or may not have been a, a really important evolutionary advance. At least many animals developed hard parts. They then had the chance to be fossilised, and you see a lot more fossils in the rock record at that point. So there's probably lots of groups that had a longer history before then. So um, this is a sort of a time scale to show you, you know, how these, uh, these guys evolved. Um, the Cambrian period down here is, is the age of, of trilobite, um, you know, where they're recognised the first time. And, and this, this is when you look at a lot of time scales, they're literally called the age of trilobites here. In the same way that Devonia is the age of fishes, we see lots of fishes around the place. Um, they evolved quickly, um, and then they went through a series of extinctions. So I've got these, these, these little skull crossbone things in there where they, they underwent major extinction events. Um, and the one that happened, there's you know, a couple during the Cambrian, then they re-evolved, they did very well in the Ordovician period. Um, and then um, after that, they become less of the population of animals that you would see in the fossil record. Um, there was a major extinction in, at the end of the Devonian period, um, and at that point, all of the orders except one have disappeared in terms of how many of these guys are around. Um, and then the last order kind of staggered on in a wheelchair until 250 million years ago, um, and that's when they disappeared. And we'll talk about the reasons for the extinctions you know, towards the end of the talk. Um, but um, So they had a, a very long life you know, as a group, 270 million years, give or take, easily, as a fossil record, perhaps much longer than that as a soft-bodied animals. Right, so here's a picture of the Ordovician. Um, you'll see some trilobites running around. They've got one guy in there. Um, the other thing you'll see in the Ordovician is big guys, predators. And, you know, one reason things die is because they get eaten. Um, and so the evolution of predation during the Cambrian and particularly his times, there were more and more advanced predators out there. Um, and it's likely that in some ways the trilobites just didn't do so well against some of these things. 
Um, they certainly responded to predators, and we'll talk about how they did that as well as we move through. But, um, okay, you'll see that all the pictures I'm showing you are kind of coral reefy places. Most trilobites you find are in shallow sea environments. Well, we don't find any as land fossils. So these, these are mud bugs that stayed in the, in the seas. Um, having said that, they actually did go into deep water. Um, a lot of them literally were mud bugs and, and stayed on the seafloor and they fed on detritus from sediment in the seafloor. But there were others who actually were free swimming um, and there's a few people that think some of them were carnivorous. Right? So every now and then it's really cool to find something carnivorous as a killer that is actually a mud bug. Right? Uh, I'm, you know, from Australia, we have a guy who found a kangaroo with very sharp serrated teeth. He's calling it paws. Right? He thinks he's got himself a carnivorous killer kangaroo. Right? <laughs> and so you know, it can happen. Right. Um, Similarly, again, in the Mississippian time, um, not so much emphasis on the trilobites. Again, this is where the big extinctions have happened. Uh, they're still there, and I think that's supposed to be one down the bottom here. Um, but they're, they're not dominant by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so the next thing is, how do you get the name? And I always tell my students when I go to schools and do outreach as well, you can often figure the name out by looking at the parts of, of the, the word itself. Right, so a trilobite, the tri is for three, and lobe is for plural lobes. That means right, lumps, this one, this one, and this one. So you have three parts to the animal. Right? And so in this one, it's really cool. I thought long and hard, and they came up with an easy name that explains the shape of the animal. Right. Now, as fossils, you'll tend to see this sort of a structure, and we'll talk about that in more detail. What doesn't fossilize are uh, antennae and the legs, and sometimes, I, I don't know what these are called, I've heard them, I've seen them called rear antennae, and I, that seems a little rude one way or another, but they haven't got a fancy name for it. Either way, there are multiple appendages on these guys. Um, and they're soft body, um, they're, they're not part of the calcareous exoskeleton, so they rarely preserve. Um, and so this is the standard shape that any kid will tell you is what a trilobite should look like. And he's missing bits. Mm -hmm. All right. This is one of the rare ones, and I'm calling him the golden trilobite because this one's pyrotide. <coughs> Does anyone know what pyrite is? Right? Yeah, fool's gold. And it's not uncommon when, right, the, the fool's gold is iron sulfide. And if you have a, a fossil buried in sediment that has no oxygen in it, it has lots of sulfur and iron in it, they'll get together. So these are places where you have stagnant water or deep water, and pyrite crystals grow. And they're going to do it where the organic material was, right? And so you get fool's gold fossils, right, which are really cherry. They're beautiful. Um, and there are a few examples. This is one of them where the trilobite was pyrotized. And this is the ventral. So this is the underneath side of this guy. And what you can see is, right, all the legs, right, there's his antennae, all in this fool's gold. Really nice. It's relatively rare to have this sort of fossilization occur. There is actually one place in Johnson City where you can go see this, above McDonald's downtown. Um, there's some shale down there, and you, there's, it's another critter, it's called a gratolite, but you can find those preserved perfectly in three dimensions as, as full skull, right? And yeah, you've got to be lucky to find them, right? Good helps, but lucky is better when it comes to some of these things, they're quite rare. But, um, Right. Um, I didn't say this at the start, but feel free to stop and ask if, you, you know, if we're looking at something. All right. There are three major body parts on a trilobite. Um, they're called tagmata, but the bottom line is you have a cephalon, a thorax, and a pygidium. So a head, right, the separating body fragment. I don't want to use a stomach because actually this is part of the stomach here. Right. And then the pygidium, right, is the tail. Right. <laughs> Right. And then, again, I've talked about them as fossils a little bit, but here are some examples of the fossilised guys. Um, and the reason they fossilise, they are an arthropod, so they're related to insects distantly. Or well, more importantly, insects are related to them, perhaps, in the evolutionary tree. But the exoskeleton um, is calcified, and that provides the hard part that gives it a chance to be fossilised, one way or another. So... Um, they can be found as complete body fossils, which means they're the actual animal, um, but it doesn't always happen that way. 
Very commonly, they're found as fragments, right? Um, and the reason for that is that these critters molt, and we'll talk about that later on as well. So like many other insects, if they're going to get bigger, they have to shed their exoskeleton, make a new one. Um, and so um, th there's issues with the molting. Um, so many times when you find trilobites, you're finding molted pieces of exoskeleton, not the actual critter. If you're going to find the real one, you have to find a trilobite that had a bad day. All right? So it was hanging out on, the, on a you know, shallow marine beach platform when it collapsed, an avalanche, and they got buried, something like that. <laughs> so, so here's a whole series of these things. And you can see, this guy, this is the upside down shell. So this is, this is clearly one of the molts that came up. So most of the time when you do find trilobite fossils, you're finding those. Right. And on average, what we think is going on is that when these guys grow, and what they do is they add segments, each one of these is basically one growth period, then they molt. And so imagine how many right, fossils these guys can make by just molting off an exoskeleton. So every individual could make you know, many possible right, fossils from this, one way or another. Right. What, was, what was the average life of every child? Um, short answer, no idea. Like we, no one knows how long one molt cycle was. So, so how long does an animal grow? Does it, you know, does it molt every year, every two years? But you cannot tell by the segments you said. No, we, we know that we know they're added as part of the life cycle, but we don't know how long I each one took. And so that's, you know, and I'll, I'll throw in one other little thing. A year back then, right, had more days in it too. And so there's another thing, right? We have 365 days a year because the Earth spins around. Oh. 365 days every time it goes around the sun once. Right? Back then, the Earth was going faster. Oh, right? wow. So we, we had 425 birthdays a year oh, when wow. these guys were hanging out. And so how do you work that in as well? Right? Right. The Earth is slowing down because the moon is gravitationally breaking it. So eventually, the moon will, well, or the Earth will stop spinning. And one side of the Earth will be very romantic. It'll be looking at the moon the whole time. Right? And the other side is going to be pretty dull. Oh. Right, that, that's the way it'll go eventually. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking billions of years down the track for that. Year. Right, right. Um, but the bottom line is, it's very difficult to. You can't claim or prove that they're annual rings at this point. There are some corals that we know need light, and you can actually count the rings in the corals, and that's how we know how fast the Earth was spinning back then, because they do make daily rings, and actually they make monthly rings too. So, uh, so this is what you would commonly find, and they do, the term used is a trilobite hash. It's just pieces, parts of the trilobites. And if you look on this one, there are lots of pigidiums. There's lots of lots of lots of tail on this, and there's a few other pieces, you know, pieces, parts here and there. Right. So um, there are trilobites in the area. Um, it's very rare to find a complete one. Um, you know, I take my students out all the time. I have a case of beer out there for the first complete trilobite found, and I haven't paid out yet on that one. All right, so well, I should say the case of like the beverage of their choice if they're of age. How's that? Uh -huh. Put it that way. But um, all right, um, the trilobites show up all over the planet, and this map is incomplete um, because I've, I've been in Bolivia and was offered trilobites in the market down there. The locals would go and buy them out of the Andes. Um, but you can see there's a large number in North America, um, and um, you know all over Europe, um, Africa. Morocco is the go-to place for trilobites now, um, and you'll see why in a few minutes. They're gorgeous. Um, and then, uh, although Emu Bay is marked there, there are trilobites all over the northeast of Australia too. Um, trilobites have also been found in Antarctica. So they truly have a global distribution. Um, okay. Um, there are a few sites that are pointed out um, that are Lagerstaten uh, sites. And that's uh, the Burgess Shale, uh, Xinjiang in uh, China, and now in Yubei. And, um, you know, I told you, trilobite, you could figure out what that meant by, you know, tri and lobe and all the rest of it. Um, I had my students have a crack at this one, and it doesn't always work, because lager, of course, translates to beer and start and station. And that's, you can tell the mentality of what they're thinking about compared to everybody else. But a lager start and site is where you have, right, exquisite preservation of right, organic right, uh, parts of the animal, right, the soft tissue, which means the appendages, sometimes even the internal organs, 
Um, and those sites require normally, again, very rapid burial in stagnant water so bacteria doesn't break the tissue down. Um, and, um, and the best place to have that happen, Burgess Shale is the most famous one. All these critters are hanging out on what we call the continental slope on the shelf, and then they slide off in an avalanche. They get buried in the deep water, which is stagnant. No oxygen, so the bacteria can't do their work and break down that tissue. Um, and, the, and the preservation is exquisite. Um, Shenjiang is now probably becoming the dominant go-to place for this. It's a little bit older than the Burgess Shale. And again, um, the uh, preservation is, is exquisite. Um, and the Chinese are now becoming, you know, very, um, uh, they really want to push the sites. You know, in the early days, they were very much, you know, you know um, precluded people from coming in and doing science. Now they want to compete at all sorts of levels. Um, a lot more information is becoming available. Uh, and the preservation there is exquisite. Right. And then Emu Bay is a little island uh, on a, a coast on a little island just off the coast of Australia. It's doing the same thing. Right. Okay, I um, thought I'd show you some trilobites from around the world. Um, until recently, Morocco was the best place to go find lab-created trilobites. I'll be kind and put it that way. Right, there was a big industry where people knew there were trilobites there, but the Moroccans were actually making them. Um, you know, pouring casts and colouring them up and selling those things. Um, I, it's changed now. They figured out if they get the real ones and prepare them out, um, the value of some of these puppies is enormous. And so they figured out that that's probably the way to go. And so we are seeing these three-dimensionally, you know, preserved trilobites. They're just exquisite. What is that guy saying up there where it has the little conversation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice image. Yeah. So, well, we're going around the world. So, right, there's some more of the Moroccan ones. And again, some of these things are fantastic. So, um, and then, um, you know, in America, so there's, there's plenty from out west. Uh, Utah, New York State has quite a few. Um, you know, again, you can find them locally here. All right, so we have a... All right, and then... Um, more American ones. All right, Canadian ones. What would Canadians say? All right. <laughs> they are the most apologetic, nice men and people to ever get to go to Canada. Even if they're in a line at McDonald's, they'll say, they'll say sorry to you for no good reason whatsoever. I mean, they are the, the nicest men and people. All right. Of course, Australia. All right. So you've got to say good day. Um, and the, right, we have one Welsh one there. I don't know what they would say. So. <laughs> and then the Russians. Uh, <laughs> right. But um, we'll, we'll come back to these guys later on. But you see a lot of them have lots of patterning. And some had horns and, and knobs and so on on them. A lot of the Russian ones, there's almost no uh, ornamentation on them at all. They're very smooth. And so there's a bit of a discussion about why they evolved that way, and we'll, we'll come back to that guy. All right. This is the reason trilobites did well. I mean, during the Cambrian period, this is what the Earth looked like. All right. And so what you should be kind of seeing from this is that all the continents are pretty much centred on the equator. And that's especially why North America has a lot of trilobites. Right. This is just like having Hawaii on steroids. You've got all that tropical water and all that marine life living the good life right there. Right. And so this period of time really worked well. Because the continents were spread out around there, right, all of the, the ocean's waters were warmer. It was very user-friendly for invertebrate animals. Now, keep in mind, there was nothing on land at this point. Right? The first, you, know, you didn't need a weed whacker. There were no plants, there were no anything at this point with these guys. Um, and also, if the water is warm, Water expands like anything else, and so it floods up onto the continents, so you have lots of shallow seas because of that. And again, that makes lots of real estate for these animals to, to evolve and occupy. Later on during the Cambrian period, some of the continents, particularly right, the, the African or Gondwana ones, moved over the South Pole, and that makes for colder conditions. And that may have been one of the reasons for some of the extinctions. Right? We changed the water temperatures. You also change circulation chemistry and everything else. But basically, the Earth was set up for this massive explosion of life because it was very user-friendly for evolution at this point. Right. Um, this is North America in detail, again, uh, showing what was exposed of the core of the continent, and then all these shallow sea areas around here. There's Tennessee down there. Again, we've got shallow seas. We've got trilobites here because of that. All right. And if you want to know locally, 
Right? Th these are places where um, I've come across trilobite bits one way or another. I take my students out all the time uh, and we hit some of these places. Um, some of them are not the actual trilobite fossils. Some of these are tracks and other evidence for trilobites. And we'll talk about those. There's a thing called trace fossils. Are you familiar with that one? Right. A trace fossil is evidence of an animal doing something without the actual fossil being there. So we're talking about footprints. Right. Um, you know, another one, right, the polite word is coprolites. Right. All right, all right, poo. Right. That's evidence that you've been there, trust me. All right, <laughs> so, right, um, and so on. And so we find, you know, all that material lying around. But there are some distinct things that have been related back to trilobites. Um, and, we, and some of those, you know, occur in, in this, this part of the world. All right. Oh, okay. So we have the redneck greeting, of course. So, um, all right. Um, I'm going to do a little bit about, if you want to classify a trilobite, there are two things you need to look at. Right? And the first and the, main, the most important one is the structure of the cephalon, the head. And it's the presence or absence of what we call the facial sutures. And those are all the lines that break this up into segments. And it's how those join to each other, their absence or their presence, right, that allows people to identify and split those 17,000 species into 10 different orders of trilobite. Right? And so that, that's the important go-to thing. Right? And I'll show you some more on this in, in a second. The other thing to keep in mind is, is another thing people like to do is the relative size of the cephalon versus the pygidium. Right, size of the head compared to the tail. Is the head bigger than the tail? Basically the same size of the tail, or is the tail bigger? Right, that was, they're the two things people like to look at. Right, so, um, so here's a good example of one of these guys, and all these lines are the sutures in here. Right, they're basically facial sutures. Um, this is a really cool trial of right because of the name. Guess who it's named after? <laughs> right, right, and there is a distinct similarity. Facial sutures, right. Right, same thing, man. Right, don't change too much. Right. So, so anyway, so that's the way it is. But those sutures make the classification of these guys. So, um, all right, and then the thorax is the central area. Um, and when the trilobites are born in their life cycle, they tend to have head and tail, and then they add more segments in the thorax as they go through their life. Um, and so the, the go-to for this is to count how many of those segments are. And typically, every one of these things is accompanied by a set of gills underneath and one set of appendages as well. That's normally the way it plays out. <coughs> um, some of them are extended. If they are, they can have spines put on the side. They're called plural spines. And that's just an extension of the, the thorax right, uh, sections. Right. And then the last part, of course, is the pygidium. Right. So when my kids were younger and they weren't behaving themselves and I was in, in uh, company, I would threaten to kick them in the pygidium um, and that would take care of that without having to go too far. But um, so, um, you know, and they vary in size. And then, you know, we have the eternal question there, so that won't come up. But the pygidium is, is right, the tail of these guys, one way or another. Right. Right. So every growth stage that the trilobite goes through is something called an instar, right? And that instar is, again, the addition of a, a body part, and almost universally, it's always right, putting more distance between the cephalon and the pygidium, so putting one more segment in there. So these are all the same critter, these two different ones, just different growth stages, right? So it's important that you get the head down right for your identification, because if you start counting segments of bodies, you might think you've got a, a new or different species of trilobite, and all you've got is a juvenile versus an adult form. So you always have to be you know, aware of that one, is how it plays out. All right. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, there are two phases to the growth stages. The anamorphic stage is where the segments are being added, um, and that will occur at a certain point. And then once you've got a certain number of segments for a specific species of these guys, they can keep getting bigger, but they won't add any more segments. So they still have the mold. Right? So they'll get to a certain number for that species or that type, and then that stops. Right? And then so, but size can, can, you know, they can continue to grow throughout their life. It's not what we think is going on. All right. And so um, then we're going to talk about the molting. Right. 
And so, yeah, most people have seen the Wizard of Oz somewhere, and I thought, what's wrong with that? But here's some malt, and this this is kind of cool because you get two two uh, of the same species, and you can see how the malt's occurring. Uh, and so the cephalon is breaking off um, on this one, basically literally caught in the axe. So it's peeled off and broken at that point. But uh, this shows a transition. And those facial sutures are important because they allow, they're perforations. You, know, you can cut them on the dotted line. And that's how these guys actually achieve the malting process. All right. If you want to get into the uh, classification in gory detail, um, the the trilobites belong to the arthropoda, right? They're segmented right, animals, so they all have an exoskeleton. They all have jointed limbs, right? The subphylum is Schizoramia. Um, they're biramous, and that means if you look at the the limbs, right, their appendages are split off them, so they kind of look like branches of a tree. The legs do. Right? A piece of parts keep coming off them, right? Then we have superclass Arachnomorpha. And that's trilobites and, and trilobite-like animals. And there's a whole bunch of other segmented things out there, soft body and some producing, um, you know, fossilized exoskeletons that um, are, you know, are found in the fossil record that are, that are linked to each other. And if you're doing the casting and molding later, we have a couple of things that are trilobite-like and not trilobites out there that you can see and do that. And then, of course, we've got the, the uh, trilobites, and what defines that class, again, is those three plural lobes, those three lobes down the body. Right. So here's another classification tree where the trilobites are down the bottom here. Uh, and what you'll see is they are closely allied to sea spiders and particularly horseshoe crabs. They are sometimes mistaken for horseshoe crabs as you know, actual fossils. Um, they're related but distant, if you will. So kissing cousins, if you will, might be close to that. Right. And the sea scorpions. All right, so the pictures at the top are showing you all the basic right, orders. So there are 10 orders of trilobites known. Um, and again, all, it all comes down to looking at those sutures on the cephalon. And then what we have down the bottom is trying to show you how they evolve. So this is the bottom of the Cambrian period, right? The, the red lechidia are the original basal parent stock, if you will. They're the first ones to evolve. And, and they're considered the most primitive based on this, the most simple sutures. Right. And then they evolve rapidly. So for the Cambrian period, all these groups that had right, any sort of a right, part of the graph there had evolved in the Cambrian. That's why it is, right? The Cambrian period is the age of trilobites. Um, they then underwent an extinction, but then you see others start then, and all the other groups right, go on till the end of the Ordovician period. So that was the trilobite heyday, if you will. Um, you then see uh, um, there was some extinct, this group, right, the Agnostidia, uh, go extinct. Those are some of the more ancient ones. This group goes extinct. And then another bunch, right, proceed on into to eventually to the Devonian. And then you see there's a, kind of a cutoff line in here where all of these guys are extinct except this one. So that's the one, last one that is still going. And it staggers on. It's not very, very common in the fossil record, but it has a record until 250 million years ago. So there were a series of extinction events these guys went through. All right. Um, again, just sort of to say that what I was showing you there is when we see trilobite fossils, and this is a bit of a wordy slide, but bottom line is um, the trilobites are heavily involved in the Cambrian anyway, and very prolific. And the only way that could happen is they had a much longer history earlier on um, and so some folks are trying to push back the evolution of trilobites to about 700 million years. Right? And the Cambrian starts at 542 million. So they're basically saying there's 150 million years of evolution as soft-bodied critters to have all those forms and be all over the planet. Right? And so that's why they look so spread out so quickly. Right? So it's not that one evolved and they all got on jet planes and flew off to all parts of the world. Right? So they, they manage to evolve and get around everywhere very, very rapidly. Right? So, um, and this is one of those pictures that tries to put everything in one shot. So you see some regulation trilobites in here, um, this guy again as well. Then there's all sorts of other fun critters, there's corals and sponges. Um, and this guy in here will be prominent because everybody likes him. This is the big dog in the neighborhood. This is a carnivore. So, uh, all right. One other fun thing, if you get online, 
you know, if you want to, because the kids will always ask me, you know, if I do rocks and metal, same thing, you know, what's the most expensive thing you've got here? Oh. Um, and so if you want to buy some of these puppies, right, you, you'll look, the asking price is up around, you know, nine and a half K for some of these, right? And, um, you know, that's the, the preservation is exquisite. Um, we have a couple of the preparers here. How would you like to try to get that thing prepped out of the rock? Right? That, that's, you know, that, that's phenomenal. And so, you know, in Morocco especially, that's the value-added part. They're taking time to do this and producing some of this material now. They sell them online? Yeah. And they ship to you? <laughs> yeah, actually. <so. laughs> With a little card that says, trust me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's, um, I cannot buy you this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there are a lot of trial buys available in the lower end market. You, you can buy them in many rock and mineral shows. A lot of the Moroccan ones are not so good. Seven, eight, nine, ten bucks, twelve bucks. So, um, but if you're around after this, we'll make you some, too. So, um, but, yeah, they are beautiful. This one will actually pop up later on. That's kind of fun because he's incomplete because that's a bite mark. So we're going to talk about predation on these things, right? Um, and, it, you know, why have spines? Because you don't want to get eaten, right? And so these things evolve all sorts of nice structures because of that. All right. Um, fun things about trilobites, right? That's a penny. That's a complete trilobite, right? So some of them are teeny tiny. I used to live in Houston, um, and uh, at the Houston Museum of Natural History, right, because of all the oil down there, right, their rock and mineral and fossil display is mm, cherry, all right? They have a whole wall of trilobites just in size order, and the whole wall was covered in that. I couldn't find a picture of that to put up here, but it was so, so cool. And, yeah, they're pinhead size. And they go up to, um, this is Isotelus um, rex, right, the king. Um, and uh, a 720 centimetres, that would be, let's see, 30 centimetres to a foot. So we're talking two and a half feet, basically, of trilobite for some of these guys. And if you look at the display, there's another one in there that may be a little bit bigger. Um, Isotelus is the biggest one known. If you read the, the uh, display, it will say that that's a reconstructed one. Right, so they've taken the pieces past and they've put it back together to make one that big. You know, so they're assuming they've got the dimensions right. With but, the spikes? That yeah, the spikes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that, that hasn't been found complete at that uh, point. So this guy is, is still a winner at this point for the biggest complete trilobite found. Right. All right. People like to use trilobites for state fossils because they're cute. So Ohio has isotelus. Right, Wisconsin, right, and then Pennsylvania has got phacops, and again we have a phacops cast in, in the collection, and you'll see lots of phacopsids in the display. All right, um, other things about trilobites, things we don't know. Um, we don't know anything about their reproduction, right? The assumption is because they're, they're arthropods um, that they have a sexual reproduction the same way insects do. Um, and most people don't go in that direction with trilobites at all. But whenever you find an animal with very weird ornamentation or unusual structures, right, you always blame it on predators or sex. All right? And they're going with sex on this one for the trident up front. It's like, look at my trident and come this way on Saturday night. What would you like? <laughs> um, and I'm like, but, you know, that's where it's at. People don't know when we have the trilobite displays. Um, you know, we don't know what male and female is in these things. They have very similar structure, and it's not clear as which way those go. <laughs> so, anyway, that's, you know, where we're at with that one. Right. Um, people have known about trilobites for a long time. Right. So, there was a cave in France where articles in there have been dated in the order of 15,000 years, and one of the things they found was a trilobite with a hole drilled in it. Right. So, it could be right, right a necklace. Right? That was before guys had to hand over diamond rings. Right? In those days, you go into a cave, slip over a trilobite, and <laughs> good to go, you're married. All right? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, people, had, and this one was heavily handled. It was getting worn out because people, you know, so it was obviously a very valued, uh -huh. right, artifact. Um, trilobites have shown up in other places. Um, Australian Aboriginals have drawn them on, on, on rock walls. 
Um, the Ute natives also um, have, have uh, used them, uh, and they were considered as an amulet, apparently, um, to, to keep one healthy, right? They had, you know, spiritual power to them. Um, there were petroglyphs, which means rock drawings are the same thing. Um, British Columbia, um, northeast China, some of the trilobites there were, were used um, ornamentally for a long time by Chinese officials, apparently, as well. So they're found in burial sites with these things. So the written records go back to about 400 AD. Um, there's a possibility that some of the Greeks might have recognised these things as well. Um, the Romans right, called them scorpion stones or beetle stones uh, at the time. So, you know, it's, it's a fossil people were aware of for a very long time. Right. Right. And, you know, I mentioned that, you know, other than body fossils, sometimes these animals leave evidence um, of their life activity. And you can find these around here. Right, Lucophycus, um, this is a resting trace. Right, which roughly means it's a bottom pressure. Right, so these guys will dig into the sand and they would settle down there. Either they're waiting to catch something going by or they're hiding. Right, uh, and so they would leave these these marks in the ground. Um, and you can find these up at Hampton. You're familiar with the Hampton area? There's yeah. those big road, right? We go up 19E uh, towards Rome Mountain. Uh, you'll go through a series of huge road cuts, um, and uh, the second one of those road cuts. If you go up on the benches, you can find these things. They're rare, but they're there. Right? No one's ever found a fossil there because it's a sandstone. It's not a user-friendly place for fossilization. Right? But you can find right, the traces of these things there. Um, the other thing is, and these are uh, fossil names for right, the activity as opposed to the actual animal. Right? The Cruziana um, are forest normally because people are feeding. Right, so this is a feeding trace, and of course it's going in one end and out the other end. Um, and so those are normally muscle marks as the materials excreted. And those are preserved in rocks sometimes around here too. Right, and then you have right, these uh, little ditty bopper marks where Trilobite's got on his Nikes and he's running across the mud flat and he's leaving prints behind. Um, and those can be found, um, I've come across a few of these over um, uh, outside of Elizabeth and again um, in uh, Stony Creek. There's a very fine mudstone over there that preserves some of these sometimes. Right. So we have you know, resting, eating, and just you know, running along, and they all show. And if you think about it, these are things that the animal does all its life, so it's going to make lots of things. And so you know, it's not unusual to find these sorts of things preserved in the area. All right. Where do trilobites live? Um, close to shore. Slightly deeper water, they lived on reefs, and some of them lived in deeper water. So we had this whole spread of, of areas where they were very successful. Right? The common thing is they all lived in, in, you know, in the oceans. Right? They never made it out of land or did anything like that. They were exclusively that. Um, mostly to trilobite feeders, um, the mouth of a trilobite is underneath the head. Right? So it's sucking up from underneath. Right? And uh, then again, there's a, a suggestion of carnivory for some of these things, but that's, there's not a good record of that at this point. Right. Um, trilobites are important because um, when you look at the different groups and species, sometimes you can find ones that are very, very similar, but they're in different places. Um, and that, you know, I mean, on, the con on, the, you know, on the continental or global scale, and it doesn't make that much sense. And so here are a few critters where the shapes are very, very similar. And, you know, we're talking about, right, an Oklahoma trilobite versus a Moroccan trilobite, and they're very, very close to each other. Um, and, you know, you see this over and over again. And so this is a way that we can actually look at or prove continental drift. Because, again, here's, right, uh, Oklahoma and Morocco today. Um, that's a long way apart. But if you go back to the Cambrian period, look, right, when the continents were like this, they were much closer to each other. So these guys were hanging out in the same ocean at that time. And then the continents have split apart and moved. Right? So it's evidence for continental drift. Right. And here's another one with a different flavour. Right? All of these dots are showing this particular trilobite. Um, and it was hanging out with tropical critters. And so, you know, I don't think you can claim that's tropical today. Right? And so, you know, everything's moved. If you put the continents back to where they used to be, 
right? It makes sense. All the dots are in the tropical zone. Right, so by knowing the preferences, we can do continental reconstructions on these guys and figure out how things are going there. All right, and then we've got the um, trilobite response to predation. Predation, that drives evolution. Right? If you don't evolve, you're going you to get extinct. Um, and this is an analysis impression of a, a guy called Anomalocaris. Um, and this, this was a, a bug with an attitude up to about a metre long, so 39 inch long, give or take. Um, there was just a major predator, and several people now claim that this, this mouth was responsible for pieces past missing off toilet lights. Right? And so this is um, an actual fossil, one of these guys. Um, I would love to get my hands on one of these things. Uh, this one's um, 60 centimetres long, so it's a two foot long right, sea scorpion, basically. That's a really nice cast. So that, that's 350 bucks worth sitting right there. But, um, right. Trilobite response, right, um, <laughs> right, one way or another. So, oh so, so what you do find in some trilobites is they develop the ability to do what, what pill bugs, we would call them molly poly bugs, would do, is they roll up so that their outer shell is the only thing that's exposed. So they're doing an armadillo kind of thing. Um, there were some trilobites that didn't do that. Um, and the first one is one of those, right? So it didn't do enrollment, so it's extinct very quickly. <laughs> all right, and these guys all survived, and so you actually do find them fossilized this way sometimes, right? In in that enrolled position, and so they evolve right their exoskeleton structure to permit the rolling to occur and be very efficient. So they they present a hard outer right, shell to to predators, right? There are a few trilobites we find where they have their eyes on stalks. And that's kind of funky as well. And, you know, there's some other animals that do that. And if you have an eye on a stalk like that, you can bury yourself in the sediment and still watch what's going on. <laughs> and that's the assumption that these guys, you know, you know they think they're going on, the, on these guys. Right, so they're going to do that periscope thing. Right. And so, um, you know, we, we, we think they're doing that. And now some people say, yeah, but that's also a way that you can be a predator and you can hide and you can do a sneak attack. And so both are possible. Right. And then, of course, the other classic way that you, you beat predators is that, you know, you get spikes and spines and horns and things like that. And some of the trilobites really become very elaborate on their right, surface structure on these things. And some of that is very likely, right, to avoid, right, people after them. Another way you do it is you get fast, right, go streamline, all right? Uh -huh. So, and so you see some of these, particularly some of the Russian ones, Right, where all the bumps and the horns and spikes are gone. Um, and the two the interpretations of that is one, if you were tunneling, if you were actually going into the sediment, all those spines and things are going to be an impediment. But you want a smooth body to be able to bore through that sediment. So that was one way to do it. The other way is that some of these are thought to have been free swimmers. Right? And so you want a streamlined body to go through the water easily. Right? And again, that's where you see in the literature there's an each way bet and no one can really prove the other's right or wrong. And often when that happens, chances are they're both right somewhere. All right. Um, very well-developed visual systems. Trilobites are famous for their eyes. Right. And so this is a drawing of, of uh, a trilobite front on. And, and this is me being going off the deep end a little bit. But see the similarity there? Right, yeah, that's a bird of prey, you know, if you're into Star Trek. Um, but you see they have these big bulges on the side where they, they can look out. Um, but the eye systems on trilobites are spectacular. Um, and, um, you know, they have the standard, you know, eye that people are probably familiar with. You think about dragonflies and things like that, like, like compound eyes. Um, and they come in two flavours, right, the schizocrow and the holocrow. And the, it's all about how the, um, the corneal lens, the lens on top that we use for our eye, fits. And in one, there's one big corneal lens. In the other, every one of these dots has its own right lens. So there's two different flavours of eye that they developed. Here's the other fun part. I was handing around the calcite. Right? Each one of those little eyes right, right, has a calcite crystal in it. Right? And so they had very clear vision in one direction on that eye. But you see the way the eyes are shaped, right? They could see a long way, 
they almost you know had close to 360 degree vision in some situations because all those little crystals are pointing in different directions right so at some level they must have had a pretty good computer to take all that visual information and put it together to make one image um, and you know people have played with these things quite a bit um, and they think that they had extremely good uh, night and day vision so they could tell shadows uh, which means predators moving is really what you're talking about with some of these um, and you know they could have adjusted individual lenses for nearsighted and fast sightedness. So you'll never see a trilobite with like glasses on, right? No one needed for that, which is also a good thing. So except this guy. So, but um, this is the only group on the planet that we know of that has eyes that's used calcite to make the lens. So that's a very you know, you know unique evolutionary right, trend for these critters, right? But um, you know, each lens would not see much real estate, but to put them all together, they had a very wide angular visual range for these things. So that's really cool. Um, the focus was controlled by multiple lenses. We call them doublets. And you know, good lenses for cameras or in telescopes, the eyepieces have multiple pieces of glass to correct for aberration and color and so on. And it looks like these guys did that. They had very sophisticated optics. It comes down with Mother Nature's pretty cool. Right. Um, this one's kind of fun. This this has a shade on it. Um, and this has been taken to interpret the animals as being diurnal, which means that they had the eyes adjusted for relatively low light conditions. And so during the day in shallow water, they needed the sunshine. Right? That's the interpretation, which is kind of cool. I think that's really neat. All right. Well, okay. I remember I mentioned this guy. Sometimes the predators do get lucky, um, and they literally take a bite out of these guys. Uh, and the claim was that you know we have Alan Nimble Carlos on that. So there's t-shirts readily available online, lots of places, right? Um, and here's the fun part: invariably, when you find trilobites that survived the bite, right? The bite's on the right-hand side. Right? And so there are a couple of research papers about the, the, the uh, development of handedness, right? That it may go back this far. And so, you know, if someone's going to come at me, I'm, I'm right-handed as the dickens. So if, if someone was going to come at me, I'm going to put up my right hand to, to protect myself because that's my strong side. And the vast majority, two to one numbers in terms of these guys, that's where we happen. Now, what they did is they made sure they found trilobites that had been bitten and survived. Because you don't want a dead one that just got chewed on later on, because that, that you know it's not moving, it's not doing its thing. So um, so you know, so there's a paper out there. Here are the numbers, you know, for that. But again, the bottom line is these percentages here, right side only, are much much higher than left side only. So right handedness, left handedness might go as far back as trilobites when it comes down to it. So which is really you know, interesting. Right. The other thing that some guys are pointing out, it may not be the trilobite showing right hand, is it might be the predator showing preference for what they're doing. Because the predator's going to use this from side as well. They're going to come at it. So. All right. And then the last thing we want to talk about is that, you know, trilobites went extinct. They were a very successful group. Um, this is a graph showing basically the number of organisms on the planet through time. And so you can see, Joe, this is the Cambrian period. That's Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. So. Um, what you see is the graph goes up very quickly, and then it plummets, and this is one of the extinction events. Right? Then there's a little extinction, and there's another one, and so on. To put this in context, here's the big one. This is the number three. That's when the trilobites finally went totally extinct, along with many, many other animals on the planet. Right? That's, that's 250 million years ago. Right? That was the big hit. Everybody talks about the dinosaurs, but that's the dinosaur extinction. That, that dip is much, much smaller than this one. Right. But this sort of gives you an idea of, of you know when they occurred, right? Why did they happen? The continents move around, and again, trilobites and other animals generally do well when ocean waters are warmer and there are lots of shallow seas, because the vast majority of life on the planet is living the good life right in those shallow seas. Right. So if they move away from this configuration, um, then that's a problem. Um, if the continents join together, then what used to be coastline is now land. And so the animals in the shallow seas are forced to compete with each other for less real estate. And so that drives extinctions. Um, predation, right? So more and more, more aggressive, better developed predators evolved 
And so the clinobots did well in Cambridge because there wasn't you know, a huge amount of predation going on. But with time, that became more and more important. And maybe the trilobites weren't able to respond as, you know, as well to this as, as you know, other groups. Um, the other go-tos that you'll see today, especially with global warming being a major topic, um, is so change in ocean temperature. And along with that, really, change in ocean chemistry. Right? You'll see that people are very worried about the ocean water becoming too acidic now because you make your shells out of calcite, acid dissolves calcite. It makes it harder for animals to make their shells. And so changing the chemistry in the past might have done the same thing. Um, and then one other thing I've got in there, and that's an apparent extinction, and that's not a real extinction, right? Because if, if you're going to figure out how many you know, critters you've got, you say, okay, I'm going to count 200 fossils. And then you'll say, I've got 30 trilobites and 10 shells and five corals. But okay, if you count 30 trilobites the first time, if the next time, next time up you have thousands of shells, Right, then that's going to dilute the number of trilobites you get to count. So there are some people saying just you know, be careful that sometimes some of the extinctions might be related to that. I'm not saying the extinctions aren't true, because they are. Right? But the severity and how you count them is all about the numbers. Right. And so this is how um, the continents looked when the trilobites finally went extinct. We have this huge supercontinent called Pangaea. And once that forms, what used to be coastline between these continents has gone away. So they've really lost a huge amount of real estate. Something else that happens is that you've got this big chunk of real estate at the pole. If you put a continent at the pole of our planet, right, you will get cold temperatures. Right, we've got Antarctica down there now. It's the refrigerator for the planet. And so we have colder temperatures within the ice ages because of that. Right? And so all of this is really important for driving you know, what happened in that. So oh, I'm about done. So there's credits, and I'll, I'll um, put on one more little guy there. This guy's cool. That's a very 3D. Oh, 